Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Medicinal Drugs Committee of the SLMA, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, therapeutic update series and the second lecture that we have for the year. And it is my pleasure to invite Professor Tilak Viraratna, uh, Professor in Medicine from the University of uh, Ruhuna, uh, to uh, deliver this presentation on what is new in management of thyroid diseases. Uh, Professor Viraratna does not need any introduction to this audience, I believe. He has been, uh, he is a professor in the Department of Medicine and has been uh, a long standing examiner for the trainees as well as, you know, training as well as in examination. And uh, he has done a lot of work in uh, endocrine disorders. So I happened to listen to him speaking about thyroid disorders in pregnancy and then I thought we should uh, get him to talk on general thyroid disorders management uh, as a therapeutic update. So over to you to that to today's presentation. Good afternoon and thank you, Professor Pridashani. And uh, so my uh, the title of the topic is a bit longer than this, you might think, but it's the same. What is new in the management of thyroid disease? So I am uh, more or less a physician, so even though there are maybe some newer things in the management in the surgical aspect, I would confine during my talk the, the new things or the update as far as a physician's update uh, duties are concerned. So, so I will go through during the next 45 minutes uh, what's new in subclinical thyroid disease because uh, before the clinical onset of thyroid disease, you all know that there's a subclinical. There's a lot of new uh, literature happening in this area. Subclinical hypothyroidism and subclinical hyperthyroidism. And other three important uh, disease categories where the physicians are involved are the Graves disease, Graves ophthalmopathy, even though it's a uh, you might call it some ophthalmologist, but uh, physicians are also involved because some of most of these patients have thyroid uh, dysfunction, either hyper or hypo, and some of them may be euthyroid. So they are purely managed by the ophthalmologist, but we also take part in the management of their dysfunction when it involves hyper and hypo. And last, I will also go through thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy. So we we'll start uh, with some reminiscence and. Uh, some, not exactly, about 15 years back, I happened to deliver a lecture on this at the same venue. So 15 years, I, I still remember, now, the same like, you know, subclinical thyroid disease controversy is revisited, that is in 2004. So it's quite technical, but even after 15 years, we talk about this in this uh, forum. Right. Now, subclinical thyroid disease, when you are talking about updates, and this uh, editorial <coughs> appeared on European Thyroid Journal, uh, not recently, but in 2015, I suppose. Guidelines in subclinical hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism, are we making any progress? And uh, in fact, this uh, editorial goes on to say, despite these two topics or two conditions are being uh, generating more and more research, in terms of guidelines wise, there is little being done. There is no specific guidelines for some of aspects of these two conditions to progress. We will go through why and uh, what they are. So we will first talk about subclinical hypothyroidism. The shortened forms is uh, SCH. Now by definition you know when the TSH is above 4, with normal free thyroxine without overt hypothyroid symptoms. Now this was a little difficult, you might say that hypothyroid symptoms as you know, but uh, even this uh, just a vague illness, hypothyroidism when it is milder, is very vague illness. And uh, even just an atepai rudava, somebody can call it as it's due to hypothyroidism. So there is really no very specific uh, definitions of the hypothyroid symptoms when it is mild. So sometimes you come across this when somebody has mildly elevated TSH, which they have some aches and pains, whether they have these symptoms due to hypothyroidism or they are just uh, typical uh, symptoms somebody will complain when they have mild uh, stress and depression or fatigue. So anyhow, 
the prevalence in general population varies uh, from 4 to 15 percent and uh, based on the studies done uh, if you happen to screen more elderly sort of population there will be higher uh, prevalence and if you happen to uh, screen after iodination or in some uh, population where the iodine deficiency is more important it will gain more so it varies and the highest groups are elderly as you go older, your risk of developing both clinical and subclinical hypothyroidism is high. Females often, because this hypothyroidism has an autoimmune etiology most of the time, so is the subclinical form. And Caucasians, luckily we in uh, this part of the world are less affected by hypothyroidism for some reason. And iodine deficiency causes, uh, luckily with most of our salt iodination program has hopefully uh, make most of our population less deficient, but in areas where the iodine deficiency is still rampant, this uh, both clinical and subclinical hypothyroidism is more prevalent. Now, what is more important is that, like most of the subclinical diseases, all of them with subclinical disease do not progress to clinical disease. It happens in diabetes. There are people with impaired fasting glucose, so called, continue to be till their death as an impaired fasting glucose, then you don't know whether it really is a risk factor or not. Similar here. Now, some of them with subclinical hypothyroidism remain as them, subclinical for their life. And some revert back to normal and some progress to overt hypothyroidism at a rate of about annually 10 to 20. So, a very high percentage. Now, factors associated with this progression to overt hypothyroidism has been identified after following up a group of people who have subclinical hypothyroidism and so these groups are if you happen to have a higher TSH value at some stage you are likely, more likely to progress to overt hypothyroidism and if somebody's anti-TPO that is thyroid peroxidase antibody that is one of the autoimmune markers of the attack to thyroid gland by the autoimmunity if somebody has a just positive TPO or high teeter is more likely to progress to overt hypothyroidism and people who had external neck radiation for example for lymphomas or any other cancers laryngeal malignancies so they also have a high risk of progression to overt hypothyroidism and someone who had radioactive iodine therapy for some reason obviously for uh, hyperthyroidism they also have a high risk now still Subclinical hypothyroidism has some diagnostic pitfalls. Now, there are individual variations, diagonal variation in the TSH secretions. For example, if you happen to check somebody's TSH which was taken in the evening, most of the time when patients come, because you don't need fasting for TSH, so they can just go and they can, most of the lab can give the result within about two hours. So you can get them to get come and show me the report now itself before I leave the clinic perhaps. So that can happen, but somebody might do it in the repeat test in the morning. So in the same person, if you happen to check one test in the evening, one test in the morning, you might find difficulties in interpreting both or comparing what's happening. So there are diagonal variations, these are individual. So when if you really are faced with this subclinical hypothyroidism, you need to say, what time did you do the test last time and you better do it at the, the same time next occasion also. Otherwise, you might again come across with difficulty in interpreting this. As the same, wider physiological range in the elderly. Because elderly, nobody knows what really the physical range. Now, you know, normal physiological range of TSH is 0.4 to 4. You forget about the units, it's a MIU per ML. But 0.4 to 4 is the normal physiological range. Even, even the first, so the third year medical student knows the 0.4 to 4 is the TSH normal. But in the elderly, it goes to 0.4 to 7. So, it's in some. So, you don't know whether it is physiological or no. And non active forms of TSH in some individuals lead to a falsely high reports. And nocturnal peak of TSH may be affected due to some sleep or mood changes. So, if you happen to check your TSH after breaking sleep for a couple of days, that also can affect the TSH level. They have some. So, 
it's not very easy to interpret when it comes within just about normal TSH. You need to consider several factors before labeling them as an abnormal result or some result worth taking some therapeutic action. To complicate matters, obesity is known to change TSH level. Insulin resistance and other non-thyroid illness correctly grouped as sick euthyroid. They are euthyroid when somebody becomes seriously ill or chronically ill, TSH level also can vary. It can go up and down and you find it difficult to decide whether this patient really has thyroid disease or non-thyroidal illness affecting the TSH level. So therefore, if somebody finds an initial raised TSH with normal FT4 without overt symptoms of hypothyroidism, obviously, it should be investigated with a repeat measurement of both TSH and FT4 along with thyroid peroxidase antibodies, preferably after two to three months interval, keeping in mind the precaution that I have mentioned here. You check at the same time of the day and check not probably after breaking sleep or couple of days. You need to consider all these aspects when you are repeating. And that if you happen to repeat it in a different sort of scenario, you might again come across the situation where you can't take a decision. So before this diagnosis is firmly made, you need to give consideration to several factors when you are dealing with an abnormal, slightly raised TSH level in an otherwise asymptomatic patient. So this is the something that you need to remember before the diagnosis of SCHS is made. So once you find and when you are sure in a repeat test that his or her TSH is above 4 but not having overt hypothyroidism should be treated. That's the next issue because the moment now most of the these reports of course they have this starring the labs have the good or bad habit of putting stars. So now most of these patients even they don't understand they will come with that stars they, they also see stars they will ask why what is the star two or one or star here why, why, why is it? so you need to give an explanation to them they know that is abnormal they might not know the range some of might know but even average patient is worried about these stars for some reason so should we treat everyone unfortunately there are no large scale multi center prospective randomized trials to decide 1A or what, what in scientific terms in real 1A evidence. They are not prospect. There are few trials. We are about 150 individuals and different settings are involved. But even having pulled them together, you find it difficult to get into one meta analysis because of their diverse populations, different times of checking TSH, lots of other things. And the, the guidelines therefore are based on prospective observational studies and interventional studies in smaller groups of patients, smaller groups. Even we have now, personally, any physician who have been working for about 5 to 10 years would have seen at least uh, per month some this sort of subclinical hypothyroid patient, couple of patients. So if you happen to collect them together, if they continue to come to you, then you can prospectively follow up, see. So these are two studies. These are observational studies, the Wickham study and the Colorado thyroid disease prevalence study. So most of the guidelines currently used are based on these two trials, these two observational studies. They are not interventional studies too. Right. So based on those studies, the European Thyroid Association guidelines, the recent one, has recommended this. It recognized two categories of subclinical hypothyroidism based on the TSH level. So if somebody is TSH is above 4 only you call them subclinical. So above 4 to 10 you consider not sure range. So when the TSH is very well above 10, little doubt that is, is probably those with above 10 TSH have symptoms. Probably or most of the time. And it is the category with TSH less than 10 with some vague symptoms you are worried and you are undecided what to do. So based on the TSH level 4 to 10, they have categorized two forms, right? So they, they recommend thyroxin for subclinical hypothyroidism. If somebody is either pregnant or planning pregnancy or subfertility with a positive thyroid peroxidase antibodies, you have to consider. 
So that is class 1A. So even as a physician, I person have situations where some of these uh, subvertile or difficult to conceive women come to you with all sorts of things and you just happen to check not only TSH, TPO and you find that TPO is high and the TSH is borderline high and you put them on tyroxine and you are delighted more than the patient or the mother that the patient has conceived some time later. So that happens. So it is advisable to treat women who finds it difficult to conceive with subclinical hypothyroidism who are TPO positive, whatever the treatment. No harm done with thyroxine even before conception or even pregnancy. And younger patient with likely hypothyroid, this is a difficult thing. Younger patient with likely hypothyroid, what is the likely hypothyroid symptoms? And if you ask a general person about 10 questions, at least most of these people will have somewhere, so you don't know whether this is kammalida, yau kammalida, my, it's a difficult thing, but sometimes this is also included. Persistent subclinical following hemithyroidism, that this category also we come across. Now some of these uh, th patients who now thyroidectomies are done at a rate by surgeons, mind you. And uh, even the BMJ has it, one of the so-called frequently done unnecessary surgeons next to cholecystectomies is a thyroidectomy. In this country, I think, with the introduction of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it is also very high. But uh, luckily there is no uh, laparoscopy type of thyroidectomy so far. But thyroidectomies are also done for each and every, mostly for cosmetics, mostly because of somebody has a yeah, uh, relative who has had a thyroid cancer, even a slightest enlargement, they go to a surgeon and surgeon is very happy to take it out. But having taken part of thyroid out, and when they have subclinical hypothyroidism, that category also would benefit by treatment with thyroxine. And diffuse or nodular guidance, again very difficult thing in my personal opinion, diffuse or nodular guidance with subclinical hypothyroidism should treat, but you could rather observe. And other categories, individuals with high CVD risk, where they have a difficult to control dyslipidemia. Now sometimes you, you uh, start on statins up and up and they are the LDL doesn't come down and you happen to check the TSH and TSH is again borderline high, you better put them on a little load of thyroxine and some of them will get that LDL back to little lower. So that is a category. And even diabetes, now diabetes being autoimmune disease and uh, incidence of, uh, the prevalence of uh, thyroid dysfunction in over diabetes is higher than the normal people. So, if somebody has a diabetic patient with some difficult to control sugars or lipids and checking on TSH and taking some action for hop subclinical form is warranted. And even if you think that most of these symptoms present in the elderly, if you ask an elderly person 10 questions about such symptoms of hypothyroid disease, in my opinion, at least more than 5 will be positive. But then you tend to give thyroxine a little bit when their TSH is a bit high. But in, in therapeutic terms, it is best avoided because thyroxine can do more harm in the elderly than in the young when the clear picture is not there, even if you think. So, elderly patient be careful because the risk of AF is higher than the risk of hypothyroidism. Risk of his congest congestive heart failure is higher and the bone loss, asymptomatic uh, bone loss, osteoporosis. Because of that, in the elderly, if you have subclinical hypothyroidism, don't rush. But in the young, especially in the pregnant category or subvertile category, or those following a thyroid surgery, there is a place to treat. That is what the European Thyroid Association say. And based on that, they have come across this uh, algorithm type of thing. Age less than 70, TSH less than 10, hypothyroid system, Symptoms plus or minus? No, you can observe. Yes, you can do a trial and see assess the response to treatment, right? But if it is above 10, obviously you better treat. And age above 70, you take a more precautionary action. Observe and repeat in 6 months, that type of thing. And uh, about 10 category, consider your, if clear symptoms of hypothyroidism or high vascular risk is present only. Otherwise, you take a precautionary approach in this elderly people with subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, initiation, titration and follow-up, you know that start with the weight-related dose, about 1.5 micrograms average for a 
Sri Lankan female is about 75 to 100 and male is a little higher and elderly and those with cardiac care you start with a lower dose that is so even with ob uh, obvious hypothyroidism but you need to repeat TSH in two months the often the some of the things that uh, report that we referred back to us is that TSH is repeated two weeks later after convincing thyroxine this is common thing nothing happened to TSH two weeks later if you happen so they, it's a waste of money for a patient so you need to wait at least six to eight weeks to the TSH to be suppressed that is not a new it is a common sense TSH suppression needs some time and the elderly same it should be individualized gradual and the closely monitored now there's a category if somebody has an initial abnormal TSH is found to be normal on repeat testing that can happen now we told that before you make a diagnosis of subclinical hypothyroidism you need to repeat it at a later time after about two to three months and if found to be normal and nothing is required if they are asymptomatic negative thyroid anti autoantibodies or no goiter so if they have one of them you better repeat but otherwise nothing is required right but if somebody has persistent subclinical hypothyroidism in whom the treatment is not commenced they need to undergo six monthly TSH because they might progress later to overt hypothyroids so that is also guidelines say so we have a we have finished subclinical hypothyroidism but I need to get hyperthyroid because I was told that we need to finish with by 40 minutes so this, this is a hyperthyroid phase of my lecture so subclinical hyperthyroidism the definition is persistent is abnormal TSH with normal FT4 that's the definition and this again has DD now some of these low TSHs who are referred to you are probably due to non-thyroid illness they are recovering after a serious illness or a chronic illness or they may be on some of the drugs like beta blockers or they may be having psychiatric or pituitary disease which are hidden now don't you know pituitary disease can be occult for a long time and psychiatric disease also similar now subclinical hyperthyroidism like the hypo is divided into two categories the first grade one category you might remember that TSH the lower limit of upper limit of normal is uh, 4 so there's a category of uh, TSH 0.1 to 0.39 0.4 to 4 sorry so 0.4 so 0.1 to 0.39 is grade 1 points less than 0.1 is a grade 2 of course the grade 2 is severe than the grade 1 and the prevalence is not as high as uh, subclinical hypothyroidism and common in iodine deficiency areas the three commonest causes are the Graves disease toxic adenoma and the multinodular goiter and there are many other forms of thyroiditis readers thyroidis and so on the pro progression to overt hypothyroidism vary according to etiology and the initial TSH. If somebody has a lower initial TSH, he has a higher chance of progressing to overt hypothyroidism. Why we are worried about hyperthyroidism when it is subclinical is that the three important diseases, atrial fibrillation, which is related to so many other cerebrovascular and heart failure and embolic phenomena congestive heart failure which is higher among the elderly and osteoporosis also a silent disease so all these three are commoner in people with subclinical hyperthyroidism in the management the objective therefore is to reduce CVD mortality and fragility factors if somebody asks why you should treat subclinical hyperthyroidism because your aim is to reduce the cardiovascular mortality and fragility fractures which are really increasing morbidity in the elderly as you know there are three steps in the investigations first you have to make the establish the diagnosis TSH initial screening and then you have to and then after the first step once you establish the diagnosis you have to establish the etiology whether it's a Graves disease whether it's a toxic carinoma or the whether it is toxic multinodular goiter sometimes it may be clinically evident but sometimes may not be evident because as you know some forms of uh, Graves disease you don't find a goiter anywhere goiter at all 25% of the Graves disease no goiter 
So we don't know why. Sometimes we diagnose hyperthyroidism by very, very unrelated symptoms. And uh, swelling of feet was the most of the, uh, the so-called delayed diagnosis. So they have gone through all rounds and rounds swelling of feet. Just not due to heart failure, but that is the reason for subclinical hyperthyroidism. So once you, so finding etiology is sometimes obvious, sometimes not so. And level two is to you have to check whether they have a thyroid TSH receptor antibodies. I will come to that. This is one of the novel or new things, or not so new to other countries, maybe new for ours. And that is an important thing in the differential diagnosis of hyperthyroidism. And the level three is to see whether the patient has other cardiovascular and other comorbidities which might increase the morbidity and mortality due to subclinical hyperthyroidism. Like you might have to check whether the patient has a paroxysmal wave that may not be detected in the routine 12 DCG. You may have to do a uh, polter. If, some, if you come across somebody with a TIA whose TSH is borderline reduced, we don't know whether this patient's TIA is due to paroxysmal lave which he developed due to subclinical hyperthyroidism. So he is a patient who might benefit by doing a halter and finding that there is a paroxysmal lave and treating him rather than giving only him aspirin and anticoagulation. So there is a place for treating and doing a BMD in patients who are suspected of having osteoporosis. So step one diagnosis is to initial subnormal TSH should be retested within 2-3 months to estimate the diagnosis like in subclinical hypo. And grade the severity of the TSH, grade 1 and grade 2, which I have already dealt with. After doing that, you have to do a, if the obvious diagnosis is not there, Graves disease with all the obvious eye signs, you don't have to do any of these things. It's, it's a Graves disease with eye ophthalmopathy. With a large multinodular goiter, you don't have to do anything rather than wasting money it's due to multinodular goiter. But sometimes you find difficult where this thyroxine is coming from. There you may have to do ultrasound scan, CT, neck and all sorts of things. Of course, we rarely do thyroid uptake in these sort of situations, except in thyroid diet where the diagnosis is. We need to make the diagnosis thyroid diet and the other autoimmune forms. If the Graves disease is suspected, this is the one that is, is a newly, not newly rather, it's, it is something that is very much <laughs> useful in the differential diagnosis and the management of thyroid disease, costly though, but it is useful. We will come to that in next. So I told you that step two, you need to look into the halter monitoring, BMDs and if to see whether there is a retrosternal goiter. <coughs> now if you find somebody with subclinical hyperthyroidism, if he is in the grade one category, his risk of progression, annual progression is 0.5 to 7, which is increased by 10 times if their TSH is very low. So, grade 2 subclinical forms are more likely to progress to subclinical hyperthyroidism into overt hyperthyroidism. And other thing is, if you diagnose Graves disease, whose cause is less predictable. Now, nobody knows. Now, some of the patients who are diagnosed to have Graves disease ask you, how long am I to take medicine? So, you having read in the book 12 to 18 months, you say make out of the cut gun away. But to your amazement, patient has taken two months treatment, stop altogether, three months later coming and showing you the eothyroid report. So 18 months in the book, he has Graves disease have gone to hypothyroid level after three months. That can happen. So Graves disease is least predictable. So don't give that sort of out of the cut gun away type of thing because it's your they will they will uh, think twice about coming to you again. So you have to think, Kiyanabhaya is the best thing that now I have learned from the, this sort of situations because you don't want to see the embarrassment that you have taken, you have said it's about one and a half years, uh, my disease is now over treated. So that is that happens often in Graves disease than in MNG. If it is MNG you can say give the Kalyama Gandhi, most of these MNGs until they die, they need some form of therapy unless they undergo radioactive iodine or surgery. That is almost a fact. And iodine deficiency increases the progression risk of MNG, especially after iodine supplementation. This has been described even in studies involving Sri Lanka. When the iodination of salt was started some decades ago, the risk, uh, the TPO positivity, uh, 
uh, overt hyperthyroidism has been found to be increased in those communities. It is due to the effects of iodine take up by the thyroid gland and it, it also induces damage by increased take, even if not radioiodine, just iodine also increase uptake in deficient situations can do this and there is a name given also in the epidemiology. So treatment is recommended for patients older than 65 years age. Now you will find it main difference between the management of subclinical hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. When it comes to hyperthyroidism, as the patient is getting older, you tend to treat hyperthyroidism. But as the patient is getting older, you tend to observe more. So here subclinical hyperthyroidism, you always try to treat elderly in order to prevent them from developing paroxysmal waves, heart failures, osteoporosis and so on. But not so much with hyper, hypothyroidism, right? So pa patients older than 65 years, even grade 1 should be considered to avoid the risk of age, right? And grade 1 subclinical hyperthyroidism should be treated in patients and if you consider an elderly with over 65, and if you find somebody without any of these, you are lucky. You have ischemic heart disease, no renal failure, no previous stroke, no TIA, no nephrine dilation, no risk factor stroke, heart failure, CHD. So, uh, if it comes to about 65, if somebody is having subclinical hyperthyroidism, most of the time you can find an indication to treat with antithyroid or other therapy. Right. And younger patients, you careful in this situation. Younger patients, you don't want to give thyroxine and make them hyperthyroid. So, if, even if you want our younger population to be little hyperthyroid, but you don't really give to subclinical forms. Right. And even especially when it is in the grade 1 category, there's no evidence of benefit. Spontaneous remission in some risk of treatments are more than the benefit. Right. So, and it is uh, sometimes thyroxine is used as a weight reducing drug by some, and there's no benefit. You might reduce weight and at the same time you have BMD and other things also and ending up with a fracture and again bedridden for another three months and during which time you again double your weight. So choice of therapy for subclinical hyperthyroidism, antithyroid therapy is the first choice and uh, radioactin should be considered if it is not tolerated, cases of relapses just like what you do in the overt hyperthyroidism. There is nothing much difference in the treatment of subclinical form and the clinical forms of thyroidism. So we quickly look into the Graves disease. Yes, we have 15 minutes. Right. And uh, Graves disease and Graves ophthalmopathy should be considered together in my opinion. Graves disease is an organ specific autoimmune disease. It is quite common in our population. And that is where this antibody comes into picture. Autoantibodies, that is thyroid TSH receptor antibodies, stimulate the TSH hormone receptor leading to hypothyroidism and goiter. I mean, a smooth goiter. 30% of the GD patients have family history and O Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that is, they are TPO positive at one stage of their career. And twin studies have shown that there's a susceptibility is genetic, and important thing is that 25% of the GDs have no obvious goiter. We don't know where it is coming from. It is coming from the normal size thyroid gland, but thyroid enlargement is not there. And this is the diagnostic workup, which, is, which summarizes the first you based on the biochemical or the chemical TSH normal, which is euthyroidism, it is low suppressed with the normal FT4, FT3, the subclinical form, which we dealt in the past. And if it is only the T3 high with T4 normal, we sometimes come across this, that is T3 toxicosis, which is as equally bad as T4 or otherwise over. So this is the based on the biochemistry. Sometimes you can finish most of the thing with the based on one TSH report. But at times you might need to do this TSH receptor antibodies to see whether it is a Graves or not. And positive one, it's Graves, it's a negative, it has to be toxic adenoma, toxic multigoid or subject. Now, if it is negative with TSH being suppressed, you might need to do a scan at least to see whether there is a toxic adenoma. But luckily, the, you know that's the golden rule that toxic adenomas never become malignant. 
solitary toxic adenoma, STN, never become malignant, that is MCQ even in the uh, undergraduate and postgraduate. Solitary toxic adenomas never become malignant, lucky. So if you happen to have adenoma, if your TSH is low, you are lucky and you don't really have to undergo major surgeries and all that. So that's why, so if you have a TSH low, with TSH RB negative, and you might need a scan to see whether it's a toxic single or multinodular. But multinodular goiters have some risk of undergoing malignancy, you know. So it is important to differentiate it's a toxic adenoma or multinodular goiter if you are really worried about malignancy risk and all that. And thyroid imaging is and nodules more than 2 cm on the ultrasound. More than 2 cm you might need an ultrasound scan. We hardly do in our country. But uh, most of the time, what happened when the modules do more than 2 cm, surgeons go and chop it out. So, no more investigations. So, we will come to this important investigation of TSH receptor antibodies, the clinical utility. It's a, it's a specific biomarker for Graves' disease. It's a highly sensitive biomarker for extra thyroidal malignancy. More, more important is extra thyroid. If somebody has TSH receptor antibodies in the Graves' disease, he is more likely to develop Graves' ophthalmopathy pretypial myxedema and there are other manifestations etc. thyroid retropathy and so on and so forth. So they are more likely to develop extra thyroid manifestations of Graves disease. And studies in the other countries have shown that early utilization of TSH and antibodies, diagnostic algorithm conferred, shortened time to diagnose and the cost saving. Well, you might ask the cost saving it is the same in our country. I just check how much it costs for TSH and well, it's about 9000 rupees per TSH receptor antibodies. But you might uh, still consider it rather than again getting the TSH receptor antibodies if it is positive and you know it's a Graves disease. If it is negative you know it's rather than waiting. So 9000 rupees it costs in Sri Lankan. It's not uh, done in hospital setup. And we will come to it's useful in predicting neonatal hypothyroidism in Graves disease complicating pregnancy. It has specific situation I will come to that when we deal with pregnancy. And imaging in our country, it's the US scan that is often done. We don't do other, except in the facilities available, places like in Peradinia perhaps, and, uh, and in um, CI Maharagama, but imaging for the hyperthyroidism or Graves disease, other than ultrasound scan, we hardly proceed. So management, newly diagnosed GD should be treated with antithyroid drugs, mainly the carbamazole, which is a very cheap drug. And radioactive iron thyroidectomy is considered for patients who prefer this approach. And uh, the first starting drug, the drug of choice is a carbamazole, except for non so pregnant. In the first trimester, you think about propyl thyrosyl. And you, you know that conventionally it is called after about 12 to 18 months, the disease subsides in most of the patients with treatment. But it is recommended that you check re repeat TSH receptor antibodies after about 12 months of therapy and if the antibodies are still high, you better continue antithyroid medications for further 12 months. And sometimes we come across this problem of uh, how long to continue. I, I personally have about 5 to 6 patients who have been continuing carbimazole for more than 10 years for Graves disease. The moment they stop it, they relapse after 3 months. The patients themselves know what's happening so they come with TSH report themselves. So, if you really want to predict and tell, don't stop, you better continue, you need to do a TSH receptor antibodies and show that the thetas are still high, you have to convince the patient you can't stop or tail out, you have to continue for another 12 months. Otherwise what happens is they will go into hypothyroid phase, all of a sudden they again come back with the hyperthyroidism. If they are unlucky enough during that phase, they might develop an AFN, go into heart failure and develop their osteoporosis and all that. So, those are the risks. So this is what I mentioned, persistently high TSH in 12 months need to continue further or opt for radioactive iodine or surgery. Now, this happened in the medical students and all that, do you need to really do a screening white cell count at every clinic visit? No. Then that is the additional test and additional visit to the lab and all that. You don't need to because as you know it's a, it's an idiosyncratic reaction unless the patient has some pharyngitis all your function derangement or with the joint is also, you don't have to uh, screen like what we do before giving other uh, cytotoxic drugs, we don't have to screen at every clinical visits. And this practice is done like for a overt hyperthyroid patients. Relapses are treated either with radioactive iodine or surgery. 
So this summarizes all what I mentioned, untreated Graves uh, disease, first line is carbamazole, and the children you need to give a little longer urea course, and uh, if they are intolerant you might consider one of these, but not in children. And uh, if somebody decides on his uh, personal grounds to go for uh, other treatment, they may proceed. But if they are persistent, with TSHS antibodies high, you can go for either radioactive iodine or continue antithyroid drugs. And after relapse, probably manage with surgery or radioactive iodine. So we we'll quickly go into the Graves ophthalmopathy is prevalence overall 20% of the Graves disease. So every fifth patient with Graves disease have some form of eye signs. Moderate to severe in about 5 to 8 and more common among females. And surveys have revealed, uh, revealed reduced quality of life. Now we are worried about your female, young female coming with this uh, proptosis and all that. It is so embarrassing. And uh, so their quality of life goes down like nothing. We don't write really. We might just give them specs just to uh, conceal the appearance. But the uh, appearance and the public uh, public reactions, people are more worried about how you look like when it happens to girls in this age. So their quality of life goes down markedly. But we rarely pay attention to this uh, graves of thermopathy much. And uh, everybody asking what's happened to your eyes and all that. So the first step is to categorize into active and inactive forms. We'll come to that. And there are clinical scoring systems, so clinical activity scores. And based on that, if you think it's an active Graves ophthalmopathy, you have to then think about mild, moderate or severe. Then only you take action. Other important thing is sometimes somebody can come to you without any thyroid symptoms or any other thing. It's just a Graves ophthalmopathy. So you have nothing. So Graves ophthalmopathy can be, they are in mostly in hyperthyroid patients, rarely in hypothyroid patients, very, very rarely in the eothyroid patients as well. Now these are the, you don't have to, just be aware that there are assessment scores. So inactive GO, if the clinical activity score is less than 3, active GO, it is more than 3. Based on that you decide whether this patient needs referral to a specific treatment for Graves ophthalmopathy. We rarely pay attention to this because uh, when there is very severe, patient is either, yeah, vision is also impaired and socially also they, uh, they are get much embarrassed and their quality of life question if you happen to run in them, they will reveal. And to assess the severity of the GO, there are again some the mnemonics, no specs, if you, have, if you uh, see the first letters, no specs, no signs, only signs, soft tissue involvement, proptosis, extra extra involvement, corneal involvement, cyclos. So no specs, if you go down, there are severe form of uh, Graves of Telepathy, and there's another word called UGOGO, European Union, not Union rather, European Guidelines of uh, Management of Graves of Telepathy. UGOGO. They also categorized into mild, moderate and slight therapy. So based on that you have to take a decision whether this patient need a just local therapy, need some other specific therapy. So what the specific therapy? Smoking has some unknown very strong association with Graves of Therapathy. Luckily our females don't smoke so therefore females, although they are the ones who develop Graves of Therapathy, our females don't smoke in public much. And so it's high prevalence among smokers. Severe form in the smokers, worse outcomes in smokers, delays response to therapy. So smoking has been the very poor long side friend with Graves of Talbati. So oral prednisolone prophylaxis is given for radioiodine treated patients. Radioiodine is known to worsen ophthalmopathy. Luckily our use of radioiodine is less because of the lack of access money. It's very expensive in the private sector, more than 200,000. The first dose, second dose also often needed. That also comes 200,000, the half a million rupees. And very few people can bust for their thyroid. So therefore, we don't see much of the radioiodine induced or worsen waves of thalpathy. But in countries where it is frequently done as the first line therapy, it is a problem. So they are suffering due to their, infla, their being rich. So patient with inactive GO can safely receive radioiodine without steroid cover as long as hypothyroidism is avoided. Right. <coughs> so this again is a flow chart. 
all patients with GEO should have euthyroid restored, smoking cessation, local machine like artificial tears for their gritty eyes, refer to eye specialist to go through whether they have a corneal damage and so on, and depending on the mild, moderate and severe, you go on. And I am not going to go through all the aspects, just to be aware that IV glucocorticosteroid is the first choice in the moderate to severe form in the active, right? And uh, inactive form can go into rehabilitative surgery because uh, even though the corneal damage and irritation is not there, just the appearance is really embarrassing for the affected patient. The slight threatening ones again need surgery and the prompt early decompression. Not only that, moderate to severe ones who do not respond to or partially respond to steroids, glucocorticoids, that is the methylprednisolone, need more advanced form of immunosuppression in the form of cyclosporine or monoclonal antibodies. So there are patients who might need to save their eyes even advanced immunosuppression therapy. So quickly we go through in the last five minutes the uh, TSH during the thyroid disease in pregnancy. We'll have to first consider during pregnancy there are TSH ranges are different, normal. The normal as I mentioned earlier it is 0.4 to 4. But here with this um, pregnancy, the trimester based TSH normal, so 0.4 to 4 no longer applies in pregnancy and each trimester there are trimester specific TSH ranges. And uh, subclinical hypothyroidism I have dealt in some parts but it is the most prevalent thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy and defined not, on, not as the 0.4 to 10, 0.25 to 10, right? In the, in the non-pregnant, it is 0.4 to 10, not 0.4, 4 to 10, it is a 2.5 to 10. If somebody has a TSH of 3, during pregnancy, it is considered as subclinical hypothyroidism. So if he is TSH, uh, TPO positive, he might even need thyroxine, which in non-pregnant stage, does not need. Now, this is a study where they have shown that increased miscarriages and preterm deliveries are common among subclinical hypothyroid patients who are TPO positive only, TPO positive with thyroxine treatment and how they differ. They show the benefit of thyroxine therapy in patients with subclinical hypothyroidism and pregnancy. So how to treat thyroxine recommended when the TSH is just above 2.5, not above 4. And uh, considered when, it is considered, now this is recommended, this is a level 1 according to you, this is considered. If you think that the patient might benefit, you can see the course and see because when it comes to subvert, I think you try some of these, uh, most of the armamentarium you have. And But patient with SCH have a lower dose of thyroxine than over hypothyroidism. And uh, screen for TPO antibodies. Women in that is also now universal screening of every pregnant woman with TSH is not recommended even worldwide. But you happen to screen with TSH in a specific group subfertile, difficult to conceive, family history of thyroid disease, miscarriages, and so on. Right. If somebody has over hypothyroidism during pregnancy, again not by TSH above 4, above 2.5, with FT4 normal or low, right? Not in subclinical, it is not normal, it is normal. Or TSH above 10. So you start with thyroxine, repeat TSH like in any other over hypothyroidism. The important things to remember is to avoid take iron and calcium tablet as a separate time of the day. You know that thyroxine take is given in the empty stomach and this tablets can be taken after dinner or be before dinner or rather like that. And uh, pre-existing hypothyroid mother with pregnancy, if somebody has pre-existing hypothyroid mother, you have to check TSH as soon as possible. If TSH within trimester specific range, continue the same dose. If the TSH is above the trimester specific range, you have to increase the dose like this. So there are formulas to increase the dose. Postpartum care of hypothyroid mother, you have to check TSH six weeks after partus. Thyroxine ref during pregnancy, more switch to pre-pregnancy thyroxine level. And now in Sri Lanka, TSH testing in uh, neonates is a universal. So quickly go through uh, hyperthyroidism during pregnancy. And it is shown that it increases both maternal and fetal outcomes adversely. 
and one important differential diagnosis of hyperthyroidism or the Graves disease during pregnancy and there is a condition called gestational thyrotoxicosis. We know that most of the tropoblastic disease have a subunit which sometimes behave like TSH. Tropoblastic disease and even you are uh, gonadal tropoblast. So they have a subunit which acts like TSH and cause stimulation. So they can have symptoms during pre-pregnancy and they can during pregnancy and they have more vomiting because these gestational hormones cause more vomiting. They act on the center, vomiting center. That is why the, you get this uh, hyperemesis. But luckily you can differentiate the two because you have this uh, TSH receptor antibodies is negative in gestational disease whereas in Graves disease is positive. Because this is a so-called self-limiting condition whereas Graves disease you need to intervene and treat. That is the importance of differentiating the two if a pregnant has low TSH. So I will uh, quickly go through and go into summary because of my last five minutes. And uh, summary and take home. I have selected two messages each for you to take home. When it comes to subclinical hypothyroidism, if you remember at least the point, these two points. Thyroid replacement is recommended in specific groups, not in every patient with subclinical hypothyroidism. Expectant subclinical women with positive TPO is a must, grade 1 evidence. Age 65, less than 65 years, multiple CV defectors, you must. But be careful or delay thyroxine in the elderly with subclinical hypothyroidism. If you take that message in subclinical hypothyroidism, at least I am happy. And subclinical hyperthyroidism, again treatment with either antithyroid drugs or radioactive adenine is treated for above age of 65, grade 1 and 2 both. And grade, younger patients only grade 2, right? So don't unnecessarily younger patients with subclinical hyperthyroidism and ATD is the preferred therapy. When it comes to Graves disease, there is a lot to remember, you might say, at least remember there is a test called TSH receptor antibodies which will make our lives little easier in the differential diagnosis, in determining when to stop therapy, in determining whether the newborn is going to have neonatal thyrotoxicosis. So this test will help you to predict whether it is less likely or more likely and be ready. So that can reduce the adverse outcomes. And Graves ophthalmopathy. Once diagnosed, just, just don't just leave it alone. And don't do that. Assess the clinical activity <coughs> score. There are ones available in the web. And assess the severity, mild, moderate and severe. And with that, try to start one or more forms of specific therapy. Because if you really listen to the stories of great doctor <laughs> people, it is the embarrassment, their quality of life is worse than having... <laughs> heart failure, diabetes or some other chronic illness even though it is a temporary illness. Thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy, use trimester specific TSH. Remember <coughs> the TSH range during pregnancy is not 0.4 to 4, it is upper limit is reduced to 2.5. So even 2.5 to 4 you can consider as some form of subclinical thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy. And Keep in mind, not all that who has thyrotoxic symptoms during pregnancy have Graves disease. There is a self-limiting gestational thyrotoxicosis. You can differentiate by means of TSH receptor antibody. Right, thank you. I, I think I, I went a little over time. No, I think that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. for that comprehensive update on thyroid disorders, coupling with your uh, experience or in managing uh, these patients. Uh, I think uh, it will be all right for us to you know entertain a few questions. If the audience has, I'm sure you would be willing to uh, clarify any doubts. Any questions, please? I'm sure the registrars might have some uh, you know questions in terms of during your clinical practice. Well, for the benefit of the audience, I think I was I was asking you a question, uh, you know, before we started. Uh, that is, we see sometimes these patients with, um, you know, uh, particularly hypothyroidism, who are uh, and even hyper, who are having uh, receptor antibodies, subsequently developing autoimmune disorders. 
I mean, they initially start with hypothyroidism and then later develop, you know, like autoimmune, uh, uh, like SLE or rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, even uh, ITP and so on. So I was asking whether there is any place for uh, corticosteroids because the patient is having antibodies. You can't do anything now for the destroyed uh, thyroid gland, but whether uh, there is a place for, uh, you know, prevention of further progression to autoimmune diseases. Yes, I, uh, this practice, we also see this is like uh, having seen uh, low platelet count before the onset of SLE in some, we just diagnose uh, ITP and sometime later we find it's a full blown SLE after a couple of years. So similarly, uh, TPO positive when you check for something later becoming SLE. So it's the same, uh, same mechanism, same phenomenon. But treating with, uh, like in ITP you might be justified by treating with uh, steroid because the plate, you don't want the platelet count to be so low and bleed and get into some adverse uh, clinical outcome. But with TPO being positive alone does not warrant high dose steroids even though I have seen some uh, colleagues are giving it. And uh, because how do I know because they develop diabetes and they come to me when you find that they are on high dose steroids for uh, thyroiditis with TPO positive. So high dose steroids in this of TPO positive patients it might bring down the teeter, but we are not treating lab reports, we are treating patients as a whole. So in that sense, I would not treat high dose, uh, high teeter TPO alone with steroid. For the same reason, which I mentioned, we treat symptoms, not the reports. Thank you, I think that's the rationale of your treatment. Yeah, yes, sure. CA thyroid patients who have undergone surgery, what should be the TSH level? Alright, so that's the important, yes, thank you for raising that. The TSH level should be undetectable. Now, most of the currently used TSA assessments can check TSH up to 001. So, it should be at that level. The thyroid cancer, because it's a TSH dependent, most of the papillary CAs. And uh, so, it is, uh, it is, it should be undetectable, you won't get an undetectable report, it is a less than 001 is what you get. So it should be less than 001 TSH. If, if for the benefit of the people, if others didn't hear the question. Yes. Uh, yeah. question is uh, what should be the TSH target for patients who have undergone uh, thyroid, total thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer. So that is uh, TSH 001. And there are other markers also, surgeons do thyroglobulin, anti-thyroid globulin antibodies, they also check that is also better marker, thyroglobulin antibodies, uh, at all levels the surgeons check and uh, there are other specific markers for different, different uh, histological types also. Is lifelong that you have Yes, in lifelong and if they develop uh, osteoporosis, it's better to treat osteoporosis with something rather than uh, reducing the dose and Okay, I think in the absence of any uh, other questions, uh, we will wind up this session. Um, uh, let me, uh, you know, thank Professor Tilakri Ratna again uh, for coming all the way from Gaul uh, to deliver this presentation and I'm sure uh, the audience uh, found it uh, useful. So, let us show our appreciation in, in our usual form. And uh, it's my pleasure to give uh, a certificate of appreciation from the Dr.